now that you know how to play Nexus Ops, we're going to take a look at it in our point-counterpoint review. Because Mike and I agree about the game, I'm going to roll to see who will argue for it and who will argue against. If it's even, I'll take the pros, and if it's odd, he will. It's odd. Back to form. So, uh, you know, Tom last week, he decided maybe he'd give games a chance. Give Love a chance, Tom. But, you know, he found it wasn't for him. No, so I'm, I'm going to tell you what a great, beautiful game Nexus Ops is. And Tom... I'm going to tell you how it's just lame. It's a lame, lame game. So, to begin with, Tom, Nexus Ops, we talked in a previous episode about elegant design. We have. Nexus Ops is really the platonic form of elegant design. <laughs> there is nothing... All games aspire to be... Nexus Ops in their elegance. Wow. Let me just start off by saying that we're talking about balance on three levels here, Tom. Wow. To begin with, the cards, the energized cards, very well balanced. I feel like every time I get an energized card, I'm happy to see it. I feel like there's, there are none that are just throwaways. Uh, they all feel like they're appropriate. They might be situational, you know, they have a little flavor, mm -hmm. but I feel like they are all pretty much equally useful. Uh, that's really nice in a game like this. Often we'll see cards that we have to house rule out, like Seasons, you know, love it, but about six of those cards had to go. Um, with this one, the cards are just really nicely balanced. In addition, the units are very balanced. I always feel like I'm compelled, at some point in the game or another, to buy one of everything that's on this chart. Uh, I know there's only six, so, you know, it's not a huge achievement to have balanced them so well, but really the... There are six, but uh, really, they're, the unit types just give me a feeling like uh, they're, they just feel like they're all well-costed. None of them feel really overpriced or underpriced. Yep. None of them feel like you're going to absolutely dominate if you buy this, but get crushed if you buy that. What I like is that you can buy a lot of the small units, and you really kind of need to in order to back up those big ones. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to really rely on some lucky die rolls, you need to pair the, you know, the mining troops, the small guys, with the bigger ones as a kind of shield. So I just really like the way the units are set up in terms of their balance. And finally, the exploration tiles. This one has been a little more controversial, I think, but the exploration tiles, I think, are really well balanced as well. There are only three types. So you can either a rock strider, a double mine, or a single mine with one of the two middle units, either mm -hmm. a fungoid or a crystalline. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you get, you have some edge. You have some poignant advantage over your opponents at that phase of the game. If you get several double mines near your base, well, that's great. You're, you're set up for a nice long game. You're in it for the long haul. You're just going to try to hold up, turtle, build up your resources, and over time, overtake your opponent with superior rubium. But on the flip side, if you get uh, several rock striders near home, you're going to need to move out. That, may, that put it's a natural pacing on the game. It means that players can't all just sit back and not engage each other. Mm -hmm. They need to get in each other's faces. The rock strider players will have to advance and bring the fight to the players with the double mines, take that territory, take mines away from them. Just really well balanced all around. It's worth noting that at least in this version of the game, there are additional tiles, like advanced tiles, I think they call them, yes. that you could use. But those tiles do seem to sort of change the balance in the tiles. There's some that are like just a rumbium bonus and then everything goes away. Mm -hmm. There isn't that elegance of design and balance of the tiles. With they're not this. bad, but they're it, not as clean. It's I not mean. a real con against the game, yeah. but you might find your gameplay changes if you include them. So do you even have a real con, Tom? I do. I do. <clears throat> Much like your humor earlier this episode, this game can be a little dry. Yeah? Yeah. What I mean by that is, uh, okay, you look at it, and any player is going to think, oh, wow, this is, this is a mirror trash game. This is my kind of game. It's got dice. It's got cards. It's got miniatures. I'm in. Speak my language. Right. And then you start to get into it, and you're, like, waiting for that wow card to come out. Like, what, where's the card that makes me win? Or how come I'm rolling all these sixes, but he's just surviving? Like, I'm really out rolling him here, but I'm not winning. What's going on? When you start to look deeper at the game, like you said, it is really elegantly balanced. And I feel like there are a lot of uh, Euro elements in this Ameritrash game. That can really be a turnoff for some people who are looking at this like, where, where is the swinginess? Where, where's my luck coming in? Stuff like that. Uh, the, the elegant balance of it, definitely a pro, but it's so balanced that it just might make the gameplay a little uninteresting. Yeah, I can kind of see that. It can get a little dry. I think that's especially pointing with the Energized cards. They're, they don't vary too, too much. They don't do anything particularly evocative. 
you don't have with this one those oh wow moments that you sometimes get with something like Star Trek Fleet Captains. Yeah. That where you get a, you know a tribbles and all of a sudden you're like yes that yeah. is those are tribbles. Captain Kirk. Right. Um, but with this one, you know I can look past that because unlike other war games that are more swingy that you know do have some kind of that have more flavor but add in them crazy dice rolls and crazy you know turns of the of the the game because of just luck. Yeah. This one it has dice and I usually you know would would be a little avoidant of it but it mitigates the dice element so well in how the units are set up. So as I mentioned earlier when you have those big costly units when you throw that rubidium dragon around you're going to want to have some bodyguards for him. You're going to want to put some humans or fungoids with him mm -hmm. so that they can take the hits. The fact that you go, that the battle order goes right to left and that you choose the casualty, the player who's receiving the hits chooses the casualties, means that in this one, even if your opponent has some big hits, you hopefully have set up your, your squad or your army in such a way that you can overcome those. So those hits aren't going to wipe out your main attack sure. force. They're going to chip away at your you know, front line infantry. Yes, I do like uh, how the dice, the randomness of the dice are mitigated in this game, similar to how we saw in Galaxy Trucker, where mm -hmm. uh, the randomness of that dice, of that mechanic is distributed across a bell curve, so the center of the ship gets hit more often, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. it, it's dice used well, that's what we like. Um, the part about combat that I don't like mm. is uh, the early game. So imagine this scenario, if you will. You're exploring your tiles, you turn, you've got all your tiles in your area turned over, and it turns out you get three Rock Striders and no mines. None. So you got to be aggressive. So your strategy is clearly uh, you need to be aggressive, you need to take some mines, but it's early game. You don't have the human-slash-clone resources you need to keep those Rock Striders alive through bad die rolls. So the, the randomness of the, of the dice in that situation are not mitigated, and it's a scenario, it's not a super likely scenario, but it has happened to someone at this table who isn't Mike. Uh, He's so still a little bitter. So, so it can happen. Uh, and, you know, the, yes, the combat dice are elegant, but the early game, not so much. Well, your old wounds being said, <laughs> uh, yeah, I do agree with the early game, you can get screwed. That's kind of the place where this game's a little vulnerable. When you haven't quite get set up, gotten set up yet, and you have a drastically different setup than sure. your opponent in that way, I'll give you that one, Tom. But uh, you know, continuing with the idea of this game being incredibly elegant, the energy cards, the energized cards, excuse me, uh, they just work so well for so many reasons. First of all, they're a healthy rubber band mechanic. They're a rubber band mechanic that really works well in terms of keeping people who are kind of on the defensive in the game. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they kind of add a little bit of back and forth. The energized cards really kind of spice up the game. And so it's good to have a natural way to work them in without just a simple you get one a turn kind mm -hmm. of mechanic. Mm -hmm. So I like that. In addition, getting them for holding the monolith seems like a very kind of commensurate reward. It feels like, you know, when you at the end of the turn, if you're holding the monolith uncontested, you get two energized cards. It feels like that's a legitimate reason. That's just a compelling enough reason to go for the monolith without having to make an all-out sprint. Yeah. It's not such a big reward that the player who controls the monolith will actually absolutely dominate everybody else, but it's enough to you know keep them going and to you know kind of, because they're on the hill, they're gonna be a target. And so the idea that the energized cards kind of bolster them when they're up there really works well for me. And finally, uh, the idea that you can sell the energized cards for Rubium. You can sell the energized cards and the secret mission cards for one Rubium apiece anytime during your turn, that works really well, too, because even though, like we said, the cards are pretty well balanced, and that goes for the, both the Energize and the Secret Mission cards, they're not perfect. And the ability to turn any of them into one you know, chip apiece, one ruby apiece, not only does that help to iron out any kind of imperfections in the cards to kind of uh, you know, balance them even more, but that also serves to create decision points, it's something we talked about in a previous chit chat. And so the idea that these can all either be played for their effect or be used as resources to further your army just means that every time, every turn, you're gonna have to make that decision. That's another you know, path you can take in your series of decisions you're making for this game, yep. which is just all plays into why this game has such a high skill value. It is such a beautiful design. It is, it, it really is quite an elegant design to use your word for it. I really struggled coming up with the last con for this one, but 
If you're familiar at all with the original production of this game, I am quite familiar with you it. You can see some disappointment in the current release. Uh, first of all, the monolith in the center, it's just another tile. It used to be a nice cardboard standee. Mm -hmm. You could put troops on top of it. It was fun. It's not, it's missing. Also, there's just something disappointing about the miniatures. Like, their assembly now, you can get some arms missing on some of your guys. The, yeah, where to go? There's, we do have a rock guy with it. Up oh, here he is. Uh, uh, these Go guys, on. what are these called? Lava leapers. They uh, they don't stand up too well. They got little feet that fold. This one, okay. I, oh, there you go. I thought he was gonna make me a liar. They their feet fold. Look, just the miniature quality on this print run, this production run, is a little bit less than what it was with the other ones. The the uh, they different colors. They were brighter colors. They glowed under black light. Mm -hmm. It just felt like a, a fuller game in the box than this one does. Yeah, uh, you know, I actually ended up picking up a copy of the original print about three to six months before this one came out from Fantasy Flight. And at first I was annoyed when they announced the reprint. Yeah. Uh, it was three to six months before the announcement. And I, you know, told my friend Ryan, I was like, I can't believe, I just picked this up for, you know, a decent mon amount of money on eBay. I can't believe they're reprinting it now. I'm so mad. But then when I actually saw it, I was kind of happy that I did have the original because I haven't picked up this version. It, there's just something a little grittier about it. There's something, like the figures are a little more detailed, but they just don't look as appealing. I can't quite put my finger on it. But I, yeah, I definitely agree that the reprint was a little, it's not bad, it's not bad, but it's disappointing after seeing a the, little bit. the uniqueness of the original. Yep. So how do you give you this game a final rating? So yeah, this one, it really works for me. This It's very original in that it's not really in reinventing the wheel, but it's taking the elements of you know StarCraft or Warcraft, uh, and it's you know stripping them down to their bare components. Mm -hmm. It's you know, just the bare essentials of that kind of explore, gather resources, conquer your opponent game. Yeah. And you know I usually play this one two v two. That's kind of my preferred way to play it. So you get that kind of interaction with your teammate where you're discussing strategy. You're figuring out constantly. You know what do I sell for Rubium? Who do I go after? You know which front. You're it's. Kind of like, uh, it's almost like if Reiner Keynes had designed a combat game. Sure. Because you're constantly making that kind of decision. You can't do it all, and you constantly have to say, well, what do I give up? You know, what am I going to focus on? What am I going to have to, what can I most afford to lose on this one? And I love that kind of decision making. I'm going to give this one an 8 out of 10 because it's a really beautifully elegant combat game. I feel like I can teach it easily, play it with anybody. Big hit. The teaching element is a, a big hit for me too. I really do like the the Ameri trashy nature of it, uh, but for my personal group, uh, it's going to be one of those games where, uh, when when we have evolved to the stage where we're starting to look at the Euro style games as more interesting, this will be the one that I'll bring out. Mm, like so, as a gateway from a Ameri trashy, right, sure, right, yeah. Because of that, sure. Really, the really balanced elements of. of Basically, managing all your resources, and I include combat in that. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's fun. It's a really fun game. I'm gonna give it a seven out of ten. Yeah. Good stuff. All right, get ready for the breakdown of uh, what's the Nexus name? Ops. There you go. This is the breakdown of Nexus Ops from Fantasy Flight. Your game time will vary with the number of players, but our games average between 90 and 120 minutes, so we give it 30 short and 70 long. Nexus Ops plays quickly for a game with alternating turns, so we give it 80 fast and 20 slow. The many random elements in the game are mitigated by the mechanics of the game. The skill it takes to win surrounds managing your resources and using your troops wisely, so we give it 25 luck and 75 skill. We have a 50-50 split on strategy and tactics, because the tiles you win and defend each turn all build upon your previous turns to win you the game. We give it 90 interaction because it's a direct conflict zero-sum war game. Only the opening turns aren't all that interactive, so we give it 10 independence. We give it 70 immersion and 30 abstraction because the mechanics of the game do serve the combat and resource management theme, but many of the cards don't. We give it 80 simplicity because it is easy to learn and teach. Adapting to the dice combat that's mitigated by troop resources and combat where winning has different results whether you're the aggressor or the defender is enough to give it 20 complexity. For portability and grandeur, we give it a 50-50 split, average size box, average size game. We give it 20 expandability, there's an expansion right inside the box that you can use, 
And you could always uh, want to add more cards, but you don't really need to. So we give it 80 completeness. For our trophy scales, we give it four trophies and originality. It's a really well-balanced war game that is sort of a blend between Ameritrash and Euro styles. For value, we give it three trophies. It's got a moderate price, but the components are really great. Mike gives it an 8 out of 10, Tom gives it a 7 out of 10, and that is the breakdown of Nexus Ops.